This episode is sponsored by Incogni. If you were to shrink a scorpion down to the size of a sesame seed, ditch the tail, and then set the result loose inside homes all around the world, you would end up with today's beast. And you know what? We should be grateful that you did such a very specific and weird thing, because these tiny arachnids, as gross as they may look, eat dust mites and other species that we consider household pests, and they don't even take up much space while doing it. As much as they may look like ticks with big claws, they are totally harmless to humans. But since you, hypothetical viewer, were not responsible for the design, production, and distribution of miniature scorpions, how did they actually end up everywhere? Turns out, these teeny tiny guys are some of nature's most bizarre hitchhikers. Is there one on me right now? The Bizarre Beasts Pin Club is open for subscriptions for the whole month. Sign up by October 20th, and the first pin you will get will be one of these little weird guys. Pseudoscorpions are any of the well over 3,000 species in the order Pseudoscorpiones. They first showed up in the fossil record about 390 million years ago, and they haven't changed much since. As their common name might imply, they're kinda like scorpions, but not quite. In fact, one of their other common names is false scorpion. Though they do share some key characteristics with true scorpions, for example, their pedipalps, their front appendages that are between their mouths and their legs, are modified into pincers. But there are plenty of differences between them and true scorpions as well, the most obvious of which is probably the lack of a tail with a stinger on it. Some pseudoscorpion species make up for this, though, instead with a venom delivery system situated at the tips of their claws. You can find these compact arachnids all over the world, usually tucked into dark, humid spaces like on forest floors and under rocks, with some even specialized for living in caves. And you can find them in lots of different living arrangements, ranging from totally solitary individuals to whole pseudoscorpion communities. Now, all of these species are predators, but they are small, like between two and eight millimeters small. Although the largest species, Gripus titanius, can get up to a whopping 12 millimeters, which is a whole 1.2 centimeters. This means that they target especially minuscule prey, including lots of household pests, like carpet beetle larvae, clothes moth larvae, book lice, and dust mites. The latter two of those have a habit of eating old books with their starch-based glue, which can be very tasty, and pseudoscorpions are so proficient at countering this offense that they are nicknamed book scorpions, which is the ideal combination of metal and nerdy. Because of this propensity for pest control, species like the house pseudoscorpion are even considered synanthropic, meaning they have specifically adapted to living alongside humans. And one thing pseudoscorpions have that true scorpions don't is the ability to spin silk like a spider except pseudoscorpions spin their silk from a gland near their mouths. They use their silk to make little shelters for themselves, which can be used to hunker down until weather improves or to protect their eggs. Their silk shelters are also great protection when young pseudoscorpions molt, which they do three times before reaching their adult stage. This usually takes about a year or two. And once they reach adulthood, they can live for three or four years on average. So for mating, adult pseudoscorpion males deposit their sperm packet on the ground, and then they do a slow and methodical dance to woo the female, who they eventually lead across the sperm so that she can pick it all up. This whole process can take from 10 minutes to an hour. But what happens when those eggs hatch and the next generation is ready to strike out on their own? And how do such teeny tiny critters seek out mates in the first place? While some animals can travel pretty easily by themselves, pseudoscorpions are the ultimate passenger princesses. You might have heard of the three main types of symbiotic relationships. Parasitism, where one party benefits and the other is harmed. Mutualism, where both parties benefit. And commensalism, where one party benefits and the other is generally unaffected. But there's actually another category, phoretic behavior, also known as phoresis or phoresy. This is a type of symbiotic relationship similar to commensalism, but where the outcome for the benefiting party is transportation instead of food. Examples of animals catching rides in this way include muscle, 
coral larva grabbing onto fish for dispersal, barnacles attaching to any marine animal that will carry them, and even argonauts riding around on jellyfish. It's a behavior that can be found all throughout the animal kingdom with tons of variation in both host and passengers. So how about pseudoscorpions? Why do they travel phoretically? Well, lots of species do it to find a new place to live, especially the ones whose habitats aren't so permanent. If you live in a rotting log, there's only so much rotting before there's no more log. And at pseudoscorpion size, just walking to the next suitable spot is pretty impractical, so help is needed, and that help comes from some surprising places. Like, some species are so specialized in their habitat-to-habitat -habitat travel routine that they live exclusively in birds' nests. It's like literally living at the airport. One Japanese species of pseudoscorpion stows away on mice, while an Indian species has been very recently discovered traveling via bat. And another desert species has been observed catching a lift from an actual scorpion. Whatever the reason or the method, scientists aren't totally sure how this behavior first evolved. Maybe ancient pseudoscorpions used their claws in defense and accidentally got caught on a would-be predator, or maybe they tried catching a prey item that was too big for them and got taken for a ride instead. The phoretic behavior stuck, though and it's been going on for a while. Ride-sharing pseudoscorpions have been preserved in amber mid-commute from as far back as 44 million years ago. And one pseudoscorpion species, Cordylocernes scorpioides, has co-evolved a very cool traveling relationship with the harlequin beetle. They do this by basically just pinching the beetle's butts until they get uncomfortable enough to wiggle around, which makes enough room for the pseudoscorpions to climb under their wings. But not everybody gets to go. A large male will often and allow females but no other males to board the beetle, giving him the chance to go through his whole mating performance mid-flight. And 30 or more pseudoscorpions can fit on each beetle, with the females disembarking with their fertilized eggs at the new log and beginning the cycle all over again. Beetleback hitchhiking like this gives the pseudoscorpions not just new places to live when resources run low, but also new opportunities to meet mates all around the forest, which is quite the adventurous alternative to hanging out in dusty old books. Some of the most bizarre creatures we cover are found at the bottom of the ocean or in remote tropical forests, while others are too rare for even a chance encounter. But some beasts, like the pseudoscorpion, are getting on with their odd little lives right in our bathrooms and bookshelves and acting as helpful housemates while they're at it. And when they're finished with their handiwork, well, they might just hop onto their insect or mammal steed and mosey on to greener pastures. Which is to say, grab hold of whatever animal is nearest and try not to fall off. Sign up for the Bizarre Beast Pin Club at BizarreBeastShow.com and help keep this channel going. If you want the Pseudoscorpion to be your first pin, you gotta sign up by October 20th. Maybe at the beginning of the episode, you weren't all the way on board, but now you are. Now you're riding the Pseudoscorpion pin like it itself is a beetle, and you yourself are a tiny, tiny little buck. Would you like a book scorpion sticker to let everyone know that you're a fan of books and the tiny arachnids that protect them? If you're one of the first 50 people who sign up for the Bizarre Beast Pin Club before October 20th, not only will you get the pseudoscorpion pin, but you'll also receive a book scorpion sticker for free! And if you just like the sticker, we do have a limited supply of them available at BizarreBeastShow.com. And now for some bonus facts. Those claws are good for clamping, but that's not all they do. The pseudoscorpion's pincers are their most prominent feature for several good reasons. For one thing, their modified pedipalps serve as important sensory organs, both for physically feeling their way around and for picking up chemical information. This might be why pseudoscorpions hold their sizable appendages out in front of them the way they do when they're walking around. But most of all, they're hunting tools, and as we mentioned earlier, some species even have venom glands in the tips of their claws. The glands can be found in the full full length of at least one of the fingers of each claw, and the venom is delivered from a point at the end. The pseudoscorpion just has to poke its prey to inject a combination of neurotoxins and enzymes. Now, to discover what was in this claw cocktail, scientists looked at gene expression patterns to find signs of genes for known arachnid venom compounds. And to give a sense of how much we still don't know about these beasts, this was in 2018, and it was the very first time anybody had fully looked into the composition of 
pseudoscorpion venom. A later study then carefully and gently extracted actual venom from house pseudoscorpions to directly analyze what their claws were cooking up. In addition to confirming the types of toxins that the original study found, they were also able to identify some chemicals that are totally unique to pseudoscorpions. Spiders, scorpions, and pseudoscorpions all have such completely different methods of venom delivery that each of these arachnid groups most likely evolved their toxic traits independently. And as perhaps the least studied of the arachnids, pseudoscorpions likely have a lot more bizarre things to teach us. These days, your personal data can spread faster than a pseudoscorpion on a harlequin beetle's butt. Thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. There are data breaches happening, and your information is being leaked. But with today's sponsor, Incogni, it doesn't have to be that way. Incogni helps you protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market, preventing issues like identity theft, scam attempts, and other shady activity. They can't harm you if they can't find you. By reaching out to data brokers on your behalf, requesting your personal data removal, and dealing with their objections, Incogni does the messy work for you automatically. Plus, with their Incogni Unlimited plan, Plan's custom removal feature, you can point to any website where your personal information is visible and one of their privacy agents will take care of the rest for you. It's their most comprehensive and powerful data removal plan yet, unlocking an unlimited number of removal requests to any number of websites which expose your personal data without consent. Go to incogni.com slash bizarre beasts or click the link below to claim 60% off and get your personal data off the market. Once again, that is incogni.com slash bizarre beasts or click the link below to claim 60% off.